Okay, so uh, Revelation chapter 14, and I, um, I want to quickly get to that uh, picture, because uh, it's always good when we go through Revelation to actually um, get to the time scale, um, so that you know where we are at, and uh, especially uh, getting into chapter 14 now, I just want to say it's going to be difficult times until chapter 18, um, so uh, stand strong, um, as you can see there. We know that Revelation 1 to 3 was the church age, and, uh, and then Revelation 4 and 5 was the, the rapture of the church that we spoke about. Um, and then where we are now is in the middle of the uh, seven year tribulation period, um, and that is Revelation 6 to uh, chapter 18. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a few chapters, and then uh, we're going to get to Revelation 19, which is the second coming of Jesus. Uh, Revelation 20, that would be the thousand year uh, rule of Christ here on earth. And then we get um, to Revelation 21 and 22, which is the new heaven and new earth. Um, so I want to encourage you to, um, to keep on uh, just getting into the word, because uh, we really trust him to, uh, to understand how the timeline works together. The next one, I just want to quickly explain for those who are actually um, watching today as well, sorry you can miss the, the picture but we can afterwards put the PowerPoint. Uh, but um, just it's a nice schematic um, picture as well on the seven year tribulation period which is the first two and a half years, the beginning of sorrows and then we've got the abomination of desolation that we spoke about last week of the beast um, and uh, that he will then start to um, to let the offerings go to himself, the, uh, the worship in the temple, um, and the sacrifices, and then we know that the last part is the great tribulation, which we're not even yet at. So uh, the bowls is the last part um, of the great tribulation, and we'll, we'll be speaking about that in future chapters um, uh, the next few weeks, um, but then we'll see the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation period. So, where are we in chapter 14? Um, just to bring you in context, we, we spoke about it last time. Chapter 12 is the explanation of God's plan. Chapter 13 is, a, is a, of, um, the opposition to that plan. And chapter 14 then is actually the proclamation to the plan of uh, Christ, and we'll be speaking about that tonight. Something that I always love reminding you of is why do we read Revelation? Okay, is um, it's to wake up unbelievers. We uh, we always know that the difficult things and the pressure allows us to uh, to make the decisions, and uh, as humans, and so it's to wake up unbelievers. I like Gary and Hendricks. Um, uh, explanation of this: Shake up the nations of Is the nation of Israel because God has a plan with them, and then make up the kingdom on earth, which means that the last people must still get into um, eternity uh, through the tribulation period before Christ comes back, and that will be the final um, call. So God's right thing we know came or will be coming. Sorry, will be coming uh, in the tribulation period through uh, three different um, series of events. The one will be the seven seals, which we've already spoken about, the seven trumpets that will be blown, and then the seven bowls that still will be coming in the last, the latter part of the seven years, the three and a half years, the last three and a half years. So, just to, before we start to read Revelation 14, I must maybe just mention that I want to again remind you that this is a person having a vision that he received from God and um, his name was John. John the Apostle, the disciple that was with Jesus and now at a very old age received these uh, different um, uh, 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 visions from God and, um, and he was asked by Jesus to share that uh, with the church. And so it is important for the church. Why? Because we need to actually see the birth pains of the end. 
so that we can also be in step with what God has been doing. And especially in these days, what I do realize is that we can be so discouraged when we look at our circumstances and the things happening in the world, and if you don't see the context, you will lose out on uh, the beautiful things that actually is coming to fulfillment because God uh, is in control and His plan is always going to happen. Uh, because he's not a liar. And, uh, and when he reveals these things to us, uh, we know that maybe we will be in a place where people will mock us now, but at the end we know that the truth will prevail because God is the God of eternity. And so, in this chapter then, in chapter 14, John is now actually giving us a picture now. We know that the Bible always works, especially when it gets to prophetic things. It always gives you a... a the, the picture of the future and then it comes back and explains what is busy happening now. So before we get into the last three and a half years, uh, which will actually get into chapter 15, into the bowl ju uh, judgments, and we'll also speak about Abigail again on even um, later on. But before we get there, yeah, John actually sees a picture in the future and he's, um, sh he's telling us what is busy happening and then he starts to speak about the last three and a half years. So, one thing that we do know is that in heaven things are completed. Okay, we don't understand it yet, but in the context of heaven, I mean, one thing that we do say to one another often is that you are saved. But that doesn't mean that you get saved. <laughs> you will only be saved when the fullness of your salvation comes when you one day receive the blessing in heaven. So we are saved, yes, because we speak things into being, because in heaven eternity is a, uh, a commitment that stays forever. So when we say we are saved, it means that we already receive the promises of the fullness of salvation that will come one day when we are in eternity. We, we receive eternal lives, and we don't have the fleshly body anymore. So when we say that heavenly things are in perspective of the fullness of Christ, it means that or the fullness of things, it means that uh, John sees this picture and he's actually speaking about things that is not limited to time, but he sees a picture in the future of Christ being, um, being the ruler. And so, let's get into Revelation 14 verse 1. It says, Then I look, and this is now John looking, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the land. Now, where is Mount Zion? Do any of you know Israel, that's a, that's, a, that's a safe bet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, more, <laughs> more exactly. Iraq? Sorry? In Iraq? No. Okay. It's definitely in Israel itself, but it's, um, it's in Jerusalem. So, uh, so we know that Mount Zion is many times referred to as the place where Jesus will be returning to. Um, the Mount of Olives, you guys have, have heard about it a lot. Um, so in future chapters we will be speaking about it, but maybe I should just quickly mention Mount Zion in this case can be a physical mountain or it can be a spiritual one. And I'll get to that uh, with the next few verses. So Mount Zion stood the Lamb, uh, and we know who the Lamb is, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on the four heads. So, here's this picture, John standing, after Jesus standing, being the Lamb. Now, why do we say Jesus is the Lamb? Clearly because Jesus is called the Lamb so many times in the Bible, and we know that He's the Lamb because the Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb, was always in the history the Lamb that would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. So, especially in the days of atonement and the times of what we today as Christians know, Good Friday, uh, in Israel's history, there was a designated time where the, the high priests would bring the sacrifices, and especially the little lambs, and offer them, and their blood sacrifices was then the atonement for their sins. It was also a time where they cleansed themselves, not just physically, but um, spiritually, to go and ask God, God, Please forgive us for the things that we've done wrong because we want to be in good standing, right standing with you. We see this picture also, as you guys know, um, 
in Israel just before they left Egypt that they had to uh, cover the doorposts with the blood of the little lambs. Now we know that those little lambs was inspected for about seven days and uh, within that seven days every family had to make sure that it's a lamb without blemish. It's the best of their lambs, the first group of their lambs, the best that they could offer in order to actually get atonement for their sins. So they would go to Jerusalem, take it to the priests, and the priests would on their behalf then um, offer those other lambs. Now, when we say that the lamb is standing with the 144,000, we know that Jesus took in that servant position, and tonight through the worship we've mentioned it so many times, the rightful place of Jesus is the servant coming to this world so that he would become that lamb for each one of us. So that we don't need to do those sacrifices anymore. But we know how perfect that is in the sense that Jesus um, came on the Friday into Jerusalem. First of all, we see the palm branches and then we see that Jesus uh, uh, in that same time went to the cross. So in this type of a lot of recognition that Jesus is the King of all kings, uh, we see that he sacrificed his life for us. And so when you say that the Lamb is standing, this is actually the office of the one that redeemed the 144,000. Those who had the opportunity to, within the tribulation period, uh, choose him and to follow him. Now I just want to quickly say, and chapter 7, if you guys can still remember, now we've done it a long, long time ago, but uh, in chapter 7, there's actually uh, a lot mentioned about the 144,000. What, what was mentioned? And I'm going to uh, stop this now, so that I don't have a feedback on the, on the plug. I think it's this one that's a big, big feedback. So, I'll, uh, I'll speak loud enough, but uh, just quickly to, to mention then that um, the 144,000 in chapter 7 was the 144,000 Jews that got saved, uh, remember? And when we spoke about them then, it was in the context of around the throne, worshipping God. But now, in this case, we know that 144,000 is uh, here on earth in the context of the tribulation and going through the tribulation. Now, they have been redeemed, um, and it speaks about a, a song that they actually sung, and, and I'm going to um, go into um, verse 2 to, uh, to explain that. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song. This is now 144,000 singing this new song before the throne, before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And, and, and this is for me the most beautiful part of the scripture. It says, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And then it says, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth, no lie was found for they are blameless. So let's get back to um, the 144,000. They stand here um, as, as martyrs, as, um, as those who went through severe difficulty during the tribulation period. We know that they were Jews. Um, we know that um, they are singing a song of joy now because of what Christ has done. They seem to ward him this beautiful song because of what he has done uh, for them. Now, the, the 144,000 then, um, 
it says that they were without blemish, they didn't sleep with, um, with any uh, woman, they were virgins, and this is not, I believe, not in a physical sense, but really a, a place of purity um, as the first fruits of standing before God as pure ones that are choosing not to defile themselves with the flesh, but rather to follow, follow Christ. This is the important thing because at this moment, um, this 144,000 is worshipping Jesus um, and it says that they are following him wherever he goes. You know, I want to be at that place where I am blameless before God and I hope that you are in the same place tonight. The, um, the challenge for this um, beautiful group of people that went through the tribulation period and through the difficult circumstances that they went through, they still chose to stay pure. Um, and they still decided to, uh, to stay pure before God. Revelation 14 verse 6 then. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worshiping you made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. You know what I love about this chapter? That in and among these difficult circumstances and the picture of a tribulation period where there is the wrath of God coming on the earth, it speaks of the greatness of God and of Jesus the Lamb that died and being worshipped in the midst of all of these circumstances. And so it says, fear God and give Him the glory because the hour of judgment has come. Now it speaks of an angel that is at this stage uh, even around the, the halfway period of the tribulation actually flying through the air and it's sharing the gospel. Now why an angel? And um, you might be surprised because never in the Bible have we read about an angel sharing the gospel, the good news, to, uh, to people. That was actually the task of man and the church to fulfill of Jesus' death. And so you always see a referral to sharing the good news and the gospel is given to God's children and His church to fulfill. But at this stage, in the halfway mark, you must remember the church is raptured. So there's an absence of the believers of God at this halfway um, period. The 144,000 is probably killed if we read chapter 12 and last week we spoke about it because it said that the beast or the two beasts kill whoever didn't want to receive the mark of the beast um, and wanted to worship God rather than the beast. So the 144,000 probably is killed. We know that the 144,000 was also sealed by God. What did it mean? He was sealed for the, they were sealed for the purposes of actually sharing the gospel. Um, and we also know that they had the mark of God on their foreheads. Uh, but in and around this period, we don't know if the 144,000 actually then, by this time when the two prophets were killed as well, um, got to their end and redemption. And that's why it's even mentioned that they would stand with the Lamb as sacrificial martyrs for the gospel. So, by all that we understand at this stage, the 144,000 is also killed by the beasts and, um, and the, 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 the killing that they were doing at that time. Uh, the two prophets we know is killed by the beast himself. And now there's no one actually left here on earth to share the gospel. And so the best thing that we can see now God is doing is actually taking it upon himself to say, angels, go and share the gospel because every man must still have an opportunity to 
to get your gospel and fill the time is finished. And I actually love the grace of God if you look at this picture. It's in and through all of the tribulation we know that this is not God's desire for mankind. It's not His heart for mankind. All of us know that through tribulation and difficult circumstances, most of us actually got saved. Because it's in those moments when you go through difficult circumstances that you are pressurized to make the most important decisions of your life. It's not when things are going wrong. So the reason why God is giving us this last tribulation period is actually to bring us to that place and saying, listen, let me give you a last of the last of the last opportunity so that you can choose. And here we see this angel imparting the gospel, the good news, to whosoever uh, did not hear it yet. And remember, you know, I've heard so many of stories in the past where people say, listen, we must do salvation because, uh, you know, Jesus will never come back if we did not receive, uh, if we did not share the gospel with everyone here on the earth. Unfortunately, that's not our decision to make or even our privilege. Because God will do it, even if it's the last angel that was shared on that last guy, because I know some of you are worried about that guy in the middle of Africa or in the Himalayas that, uh, that never heard the gospel. He will also receive the gospel because it, by all means, God will still use the opportunity to share again so that nobody can say that they did not have the opportunity to to decide. And in doing so, we see the beautiful heart of God being manifested in mankind um, to the, 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 the full end. Now, we spoke about Mount Zion. I want to actually get back to a few scriptures, maybe, um, if you don't turn the mind. Um, Nigel, but. Um, at this stage, Mount Zion, Hebrews 12, verse 18, speaks of the heavenly Mount Zion. It says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, a darkness, a gloom, and a tempest. Speaking about Mount Zion. It's not something that you can touch. It's not speaking about a, a earthly Mount Zion. So in heaven, there's a Mount Zion that is um, a duplication of what's um, happening on earth. Hebrews 2, 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to um, innumerable angels and uh, festival gathering. Now, these are the only two times in the Bible that you actually read about Mount Zion not being a physical place, but a heavenly picture. The other times, which is, I think, over two, uh, 200 times, it is mentioned as the physical space that we know that Jesus will be coming back to when he starts to rule for a thousand years uh, in, in his millennial rule uh, here on earth. So, back to the picture of 144,000. Hebrews 12, verse 28, speaks about, speaks about this fear of God that is mentioned in. And it says in verse 28, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping Him with a holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. Now, who of you have experienced God as a devouring fire? What does it speak of? The divine fire of God, what does it speak of? Because at this time, when these angels mention about the time is right and that it's um, the time for the wrath of God uh, to be finally here poured out, it speaks of the greatness of God, but it uh, also mentions that God is this awesome God to be feared. Now, if you are saved, what does that mean? Maybe I should start off with, if you are not saved, what does it mean when God is a consuming fire? You're in trouble. <laughs> 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 because 
Because if you're on the wrong end of the consuming fire, guess what's going to happen? You know, you're going to suit. You need to uh, get a lot of the right of God against you. But if you are saved, the picture looks a lot different. Because when it says that we should fear God and we must have an holy awe and reverence of Him, it speaks of something different for us who knows Him and loves Him dearly. Because for us, it means that we actually want to please Him and we want to actually be in a good same with Him. So like the 144,000, I just want to say today, our desire should be always to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. To be wherever the land is moving and whatever He's busy doing here on earth. Because Jesus is tirelessly working at His church and preparing His bride for His return. And that means that He more than us wants to see the church succeed until He returns. And so in doing so, you and I find ourselves either to be involved with, and that is what's so beautiful about the picture of 144,000, that in the midst of the difficult circumstances, they might make the right decisions. They stay morally on the right path, they stay focused in God, and they follow Jesus with, with whatever they um, have within them. And so for you and I, that means that that should be our desire. Mm -hmm. Is to be in a moral good standing, not just because we want to do things right, but because we want to live the kind of lives that glorify the King. Now, come and say this one. That's not where the world is at. The pleasures of the world is a lot more important to it than to be obedient. God. It's a sacrificial living like this, and, and it's using a sexual um, uh, uh, picture here of being virgins, but I, I can tell you, I think that's not the focus even. I don't think it's as if, you know, there's, there's such a controversy around this uh, picture of 144,000. I mean, there's even other religions that's using um, this as an opportunity to say that um, they need to... Uh, to get the nice gifts there one day in heaven um, because of their purity. Let me just get back to you. For these 144,000 people, it's not about the sexual um, purity that they stay to, it's the desire to stay focused on the things of God and to, to, uh, to love God with their full heart in such a way that in the midst of difficult times. Why do we listen and go through tribulation? Because we need to know what God's heart is for these people in the midst of that don't don't even talk about getting into difficult circumstances before we make that decision. Let's make it out of our hearts because we want to be in our standing with the one that we fear most, the one that we love most, the one that we want to always uh, see uh, being blessed in our lives. Revelations 14 verse 8. Another angel. A second follow saying. So we have this first angel that is uh, proclaiming that the judgment is coming. The second following saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual Morality. So this second uh, angel speaks about the fall of Babylon. Now we will speak about it in the next uh, chapters as well. But the fall of Babylon is clearly, um, and, and, and this is not the physical empire of the 539 uh, BC Babylon that fell uh, in the Persian um, times. But clearly, this is a religious and a economic system that is controlling the world. And so, until Jesus returns, this Babylonian um, model will rule the, the thoughts and the ways of mankind in such a way that we know that one world order will, will actually use economic means to govern the world. And 
so I've just re read a recent article in uh, Politico, and it, um, the heading was, Look out, here comes a new world order, the survey says. And, uh, and this is interesting in the context of a divided world at this moment, and uh, world powers um, standing against one another. But it says, European and American citizens hold many views, and this was a survey done, in common about major global questions, including that they should help Ukraine to win. While citizens in China, India, and Turkey prefer a quick end to the war, even if, it, uh, if uh, Ukraine has to concede territory. Based on polling carried out in December 22 and January 23, in Western countries surveyed large majorities, 77% in the UK, 71% in the US, and 65% in nine EU members describe Russia as an adversary or rival of their own country. On the contrary, large numbers in China, 76%, so it's as large a um, percentage, in India, 77%, and in Turkey, 73%, not only see continued strength in Russia and view it as a strategic ally and partner of their country, but many also believe Kiev should consider surrendering territory to help and uh, end the conflict quicker. Now, in the midst of all of this, the New World Order, you know, is in big divide about uh, right and wrong of current policies, and we all know Ukraine is in the midst of this, but it's busy happening. In the midst of all of this, there's more than ever uh, different politicians saying that one world order is the only solution toward a, um, a communal or, or, or a, a unified stance uh, in world peace. There's no ways that, um, that there can be a world order if there's not um, one government that can rule the world can bring an end to the conflict that is happening. Clearly, if you look at these polls, and if you look at uh, what people see as, as uh, current tendencies, there's big things to be happening. And, uh, and we can see that it's not as if either one of the sides are busy backing up, are backing down. But it's just strengthening its cause, whilst the only solution at the table is to bring one World government. And so um, over and over we know that uh, the same conversation is put on the table, uh, less borders, you know, open the borders so that we've got open borders in every country, let's let the nationalism die so that global rule can actually take place. Now you and I don't know what that means, but what I can say in the context of what the relation is talking about. In, uh, in one world governance, it means that it's going to happen. <laughs> and it's busy happening uh, before us. And uh, it's not something that seems so far off even. But we know then, by even last week's conversation in chapter 12, about what the beast will do, is that the second the prophet will actually by economic means, force the world to subdue themselves and to submit to a one world um, government. So let's get to, to verse 9 of chapter 14. And another angel, the third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark, and this is the third angel, keep that in mind. If anyone receives the mark on his forehead or in his hand, or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, for full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshippers 
of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. So we see the picture um, of those who were not marked, but also those who were marked then um, to be condemned by God. Let's go to uh, verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud one is the Son of Man, which we know is Jesus, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. And this fully ripe, we know, does not necessarily mean a good ripe. It can be a good or a bad ripe, but it's coming to an end. Um, and, uh, and it says, says in verse 16, So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. And then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to those, to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle, and gather the clusters from the wine, of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle, 400 or 1,600 stadia. So this is the final part of. Uh, this vision that, um, that John sees. Now, to, to end off tonight, um, we see the, after the three angels, uh, there's a new set of angels released, and Jesus with a sickle that actually um, is, um, is presented, but then these three angels actually go and execute something that he wants as the final judgment, coming to reap here on the earth. Now the first one is the angel that makes the announcement that the harvest um, of the earth is ready. The second angel is the one that uh, of the deployment, of the angel from the temple of the sharp sickle. And then there's the third one, uh, which we know is the one that, um, that says that the judgment is coming. And he actually refers back to the second one and he says, let the one with the sharp sickle, which is the second one, come now start to reap the earth. Now we know that this is a harvest that is either a good harvest or a bad harvest. We know that Jesus said that you will never know the good and the bad seed until it grows to a point where you can see the fruit. So at this point, the only way that we'll see what it is, because both will be reaped at this time. The wine quest is... For those of you that don't know, I've uh, grown up in what is um, called the Boerland in South Africa. And, uh, and they, in uh, the Boerland, it's the wine country. It's a place where you uh, produce out of grapes very nice wine. Okay? <laughs> now, for those of you that know Stellenbosch and uh, Paul and all of those amazing places in South Africa would, would know, that um, the wine lands, as it is called, is a place uh, that produces not just nice wine, but beautiful landscapes. Um, but as a child, I remember always at school, we had this opportunity to go and help with the harvest. And then uh, in the olden days, you will have um, the grapes in a big, 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 And then uh, you would, as children, jump into the vat and you will start to press down with your feet the grapes until it becomes juice. Uh, 
Uh, and that is actually how the process start of making wine. So uh, these days is luckily less bacteria and uh, amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, uh, now Pete, uh, that's some um, trampling on the, the nice grapes. Um, there's um, a machinery that does all of the good work. So don't worry, South Africa is not in the jungle. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the beautiful thing it happens in France and part of the next world. So uh, <laughs> the beautiful thing about it is that, that unless those grapes are pressed down and it, the juice can come out, you know, we will never know how good the, the, the harvest really is when it comes to one maybe. Because the grapes must be a certain um, level of, there must be sugar in it, there must be, you know, whatever is necessary for the kind of one that you want to make. But unless you press it down, you will never know the fruit. And so, at this final stage, the last three and a half years, the great judgment that will be happening. Clearly, it's tightening. But it's tightening for a purpose. So that the last can still make the choice to be under the wine press and rather make a decision while they still can than die for eternity and be tormented in an eternal fire and hell presented with. Um, Satan and all of these followers. So for us, the beautiful thing is that knowing and fearing God is just a pleasure because we love it. We trust Him. We know that He's in total control of our lives. And we might think that He in the flesh in order to survive the times of life. We want to be pure as those who will get that amazing, amazing reward when they get to heaven. And it's clear that 144,000 is commended by God. And they will get their eternal blessing. Yes, it was tough here on earth, and of course it's the most severe circumstances that they had to go through. But their reward lies in turn. And if it counts for them, it counts for you and I, while we go through the times of the pain, the birth pains, and the last of pains. It's a choice to go beyond indulging in the flesh and just doing whatever seems fit in our natural state, in our beastly desires. And I want to say beastly because we are none other if we don't serve God. Because in our own ways, we will always turn back to be horrible. With God in our lives, what a blessing to have the sweet fragrance of God living through our lives. The wine press is designed for people to make that last choice. In conclusion tonight, we might go through mocking these Christians like Noah was in his time. Having a dream and a vision and a promise from God, salvation and redemption and staying pure to God's command, staying pure to be obedient to what He wants for your life. And other people might mock you now and they might think that you're crazy. But yet, you know that our reward lies within our relationship. Be prepared. Jesus is coming. And I love the, the Acts church. They went through severe circumstances and they really thought that Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> they thought it was the end of days and that it was the birth pains of, uh, of the last day. And yet we are now <laughs> 2,000 years later and still we think that it is very close. And I do think it is. But what I can say is, for us, that means, like the church in Acts, we have an expectation and an urgency within us to say, Maranatha. Mm -hmm. That's how they treated one another. 
again and again. Whenever they saw one another, they said, Maranatha, what does it mean? Let Jesus come soon. Let him come as soon as possible, as quick as possible. Let us rather die and we are going to eternity with him. Don't fear your life. Don't fear the life that we've got here on earth. Because eternity is amazing that we want to give up most. Maranatha, come back Jesus. And then lastly in conclusion, no one will prevent the plan of God. Not Ethan, <laughs> not Biden. Uh, oh, Morris is not coming here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, are we um, in the times that we live, forget that his plan is going to come to fruition? He's going to fulfill every little detail of it. All that we need to do is to see his hand, his heart, and wherever he moves. Like the 144,000, moving wherever Jesus wants. Let's close up. Jesus, I want to just ask whoever can be faithful just to stop that.